It's the week of May 21st, 2018, and you're listening to the Missouri edition of the Pioneer Growing Point Agronomy podcast. I'm your co-host, Jamie Farmer, Pioneer Field Agronomist for Northwest Missouri. Joining me as always is my counterpart to the east, Nick Martin. Today we focus on corn, everything that we've noticed in the field and things to keep an eye on in the weeks ahead. Welcome back and thanks for tuning in. Welcome back, Nick. So pretty good uh, little stretch there for some scouting. I'm sure yourself as well as many of our growers have been out there looking at some of the corn. So what are some of the things that you've noticed, some of the things to keep an eye out on as we look to the weeks ahead here? Yeah, Jamie, really, as we think about what's currently going on, you know, one of the major things on the top of people's mind, especially in those dry areas or dry parts of the field, just the uneven corn emergence, how's that going to impact my yield potential? Getting that question a lot. Looking at nutrient deficiencies in corn, we're starting to see a fair amount of that showing up. And then as we start thinking about weeks ahead, there's a lot of posting on corn going on now, a lot more to continue with. So we need to think about herbicide restrictions by corn growth stage. And then we might even cap off with just a little bit of what's going on with your corn plant right now. Yeah, that's uh, all good topics, things to keep in mind of right now. So if we're thinking about, you know, that first one there, impact of uneven corn emergence on yield potential. So like you mentioned, we have seen the impact of maybe some places where we've shallowed up a little bit or too shallow with our planting. We see differences in soil type, even differences uh, in field moisture conditions at tillage time and have seen quite a bit of NH3 or anhydrous ammonia burn, particularly that that was uh, spring applied. So when you think about that, all of these things have definitely impact uniformity of emergence, um, some a little bit more severe than other. I think a majority of that comes into effect with the dry conditions that a majority of both of our regions have had this spring. Yeah, Jamie, I really think, you know, there really are a lot of really good uniform fields out there to look at, but there's also, especially in pockets where we've been really, really dry, there's a fair amount of uneven corn emergence just due to those factors you talked about. So a lot of times question, what what's the impact of yield there? How bad am I hurt? So I guess some of the data out there would say uniformity of emergence is going to impact anywhere from 5 to 9% of yield potential. That can vary quite a bit though, because that, that range probably catches most of the fields out there. Um, since the unevenness is typically constrained to just one part of the field, not the whole thing. But there's some older data out there, you know, if you have a field that's really, really uneven where we had some stuff, Jamie, that was V3, V4, and had seed laying in dry dirt next to it, some of those drier parts of the field that just got moisture, and so we've got VE to V4. And some of that older data would show that uneven emergence could cost you as much as 20%, and that was them showing a difference in three weeks planting date within that same row. Spots in the field may be this high, but typically that whole field is not gonna be that bad, so probably that five to 9% is probably a pretty good range to, to land at. So just one last quick thing on that topic, just the typical thinking has been, if a plant is more than one leaf stage behind, it's probably a runt. That makes sense if there's bigger plants around it, but one thing you have to think about in this particular situation with the dry conditions, just the fact that there are gonna be a lot of rough small plants right next to each other, so that whole comment may not necessarily come into play across the field, Jamie. Excellent points, Nick. Uh, I think that sums it up pretty good. That 5 to 9% is probably where a vast majority of that stuff would fall as far as what is the potential impact on that uneven emergence. But like you said, there are some, some extreme cases out there where we have pretty large degree of separation in those early V stages, you know, possibility for a little bit more impact in those situations. You know, we talked a little bit there, so we had several things we wanted to focus on. One other thing that keeps showing up a lot here recently is uh, nutrient deficiencies in corn. So we're seeing a lot of yellow corn plants in various areas a lot of nutrient deficiencies showing up. And really there's probably two reasons uh, why we're seeing that here in the northern part of Missouri. So we just talked a little bit about how dry we can be in most of those areas. Corn plant can have access to the nutrients. And so when you get in that dry weather, certain nutrients need more water to move into the plant and become also become mineralized from organic matter. So lack of moisture is having an effect on some particular nutrients and then also the stage of the corn growth. So we think about the stage, it's pretty interesting across the area how much of this corn is at a very similar stage, you know, with the planting window there getting going at roughly the same time for a majority of us. We have a lot of corn that has reached that V3 stage, 
where the plant is transitioning off those reserves in the kernel and is moving on to its own seedling root system. Um, you combine that transition with those dry soils and we can see a lot of uh, those nutrient deficiencies and particularly some of those micronutrient deficiencies showing up. So not every field is the same, but the number one deficiency that I have been seeing in Northwest Missouri would be sulfur deficiency. So could you just talk a little bit about the intricacies of sulfur deficiency and, and what we're seeing there, Nick? Yeah, Jamie. So sulfur deficiency has been the number one problem we've been seeing on the east side of the state. So if you think about sulfur deficiency, you just got to think about the fact that sulfur gets mineralized from organic matter. In order to have mineralization of organic matter, we have to have some moisture along with temperature. So you've got the temperature, we don't have the moisture, so we're not mineralizing that organic matter. Which means if you're not adding a sulfate form of fertilizer or sulfur into your program, you're probably going to see more of a deficiency. So we're seeing some fields where we put starter down with sulfur in it, like an ammonium thiosulfate. Uh, fields where we put ammonium sulfate on a dry form, put that on ahead of planting. Those fields, some of those fields are looking a lot greener because they've got that sulfate form immediately available. The other thing I typically get is, well, I add sulfur, Jamie, to my fall applied fertilizer. So how come I'm not seeing the effects of that here? Well, one thing to remember there is a lot of the times in the fall, we're just adding elemental sulfur. Elemental sulfur has to get converted over to a usable form, which is a sulfate form. That does not happen until we get warmer temperatures, which means a lot of times when the corn plant needs it right now, it's not in the sulfate form, so we almost miss it altogether. Just something to realize that if you want to be proactive and fix that maybe for next time, I would seriously consider adding a sulfate form of fertilizer to your corn fertility program, whether that's ammonium sulfate, whether that's ammonium thiosulfate. So moisture will help fix a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now. And as that corn plant gets bigger, starts relying on its permanent root system, we get some moisture, it's probably going to come out of that, Jamie. Good point. Excellent point there. So seeing, those, seeing some of those nutrient deficiencies, uh, product of the environment, um, also probably a product of just the stage that corn crops at in a majority of our areas. So, you know, moving on here to something that to be thinking about in the weeks to come, we mentioned there that a lot of corn is being posted or, or soon to be posted with herbicide program. You got to think about herbicide restrictions by the crop growth stage. So we thought it might be good to review a few of the key herbicide restrictions by a particular crop growth stage. Seems like every year we have some weather challenges or some reason why we get pushed on the growth stage. It's important to understand that many herbicides have a cutoff application window by a maximum corn growth stage, so it's important to read those herbicide labels and understand them so that way you can avoid any sort of accidental yield impact that you could incur just by simply reading the label and being up to date on what your corn growth stage is. Some of the particular products to think about, one of ours, uh, Resicor, up to 11 inches, cut off there, Realm Q, another one, through V6 or 20 inch tall, whichever one of those is the most restrictive. You think about Roundup or any glyphosate product, Abundant, et cetera, you go through V8 or 30 inch corn, whichever one of those are most restrictive. You know, one of the questions we get, Nick, is why, if a hybrid is Roundup ready, uh, do we have to worry about that cutoff for, for Roundup or glyphosate? Yeah, Jamie, so if we're broadcasting over top of Roundup Ready corn, we still have to abide by that V8 or that 30 inches tall. The reason being is even though that plant is Roundup tolerant or Roundup resistant, is if that plant has some glyphosate in it when it goes to pollination time frame, some of those kernels are not going to be Roundup resistant, which means theoretically it could kill as many as 25% of the kernels if it's still in the plant when it pollinates. That's why we need to adhere to that rule there. Excellent point there, and uh, one question we always get on that. A couple others here, just real quick, Callisto, Halex GT, etc., through V8 or 30 inch, again, whichever one of those are most restrictive. And then impact is 45 days pre-harvest, so one of those that uh, we still got a ways to go there for sure. So one of the things that, uh, you know, you talk about growth staging corn for herbicide restrictions, uh, you usually get the questions, okay, what's the proper way to identify growth stages when that first leaf falls off? So we've got a link that we'll throw up on Twitter and that we'll also have access to reach out to your pioneer sales professional on how to properly grow stage corn, particularly later on when those lower leaves tend to fall off. 
with that in mind, uh, just one final topic. We're thinking about the weeks ahead, like we just mentioned here with restrictions that we need to keep in mind. So what's really happening out there right now, Nick, with, uh, with our corn plants? Yeah, so Jamie, one thing you just mentioned earlier, a lot of the corn in that bulk of that window is probably V3, V4. That corn plant goes from, at V3, it's starting to transition away from those kernel reserves onto its root system or seedling root system. But then as we move forward, we move into V5, then that is when that plan is gonna determine how many rows around that ear is gonna be. So we're already getting kernel rows determined at that stage, at the V5 stage. And then when we push on forward to V6, that's when the growing point's gonna move above ground. So if we get a hail event at that stage and it shears that plant off, it could potentially kill it if that growing point already made its way above. Uh, at V6, we also get that transition away from the seedling root system onto the permanent root system. And that is generally when we see those fields start to look a little uneven and they start to get maybe a little ugly color to them. And then all of a sudden you come back a week later and they're dark green and can grow on like crazy. That's what was happening at that stage. It was starting to switch to the permanent root system. Um, at V6, we we're also moving very close to that rapid uptake of nitrogen. So we're starting to see that, that curve really get really, really steep. Just sometimes people question, you know, how fast do I move through V stages, Jamie? Just it takes about 80 growing degree units at this stage of the game to move a new leaf. So if you factor what our current temperatures are, that means something that's V3 now we might be moving into something that's V5, or if it's V4 now, it might be V6 in a week from now. Yeah, excellent point. So about three to four days there uh, between leaf stages with the way the temperatures are running now. So with that in mind, we're going to push right through. So that's why we definitely wanted to cover the herbicide restrictions by corn growth stage. We talked a little bit about some of the sulfur deficiencies and other nutrient deficiencies that we're seeing in our corn and some of the reasons why we're seeing that at this particular stage in the game and, and certain environments. And then, you know, obviously started out there with uh, what sort of impact we could expect with uneven corn emergence on yield potential. So with all of that in mind, we just want to thank you all for tuning in again. We look forward to uh, seeing you out in the field and talking to you next time about uh, a little bit more on soybeans always important to know where to find the podcast nick so where should people look for the links and other timely info yeah so you can find the podcast at podcast.pioneer.com and you can also find it on twitter i'm at nick money and i'm at the jamie farmer you can also reach out to your pioneer sales professional and ask to be signed up for uh, walking your fields newsletter a monthly newsletter that we put out there with timely topics and also get looped in on email newsletter for each time we come out with a new edition of the podcast. So again, thanks again. Thank you for your business and we look forward to seeing you again.